Welcome to A Year of War and Peace. I'm your host, Brian E. Denton. A Year of War and Peace is a daily, year-long, chapter-by-chapter reading of and meditation on Leo Tolstoy's epic novel, War and Peace. In these videos and podcasts, you'll be treated to a free reading of one chapter per day of the novel, plus a reflective essay I've written individually tailored to that day's chapter. These readings are offered for free, though if you'd like to support me, you can do so in one of three ways. First, you could purchase my ebook, A Year of War and Peace. It features the entire novel, plus all of my reflective essays, and it's only $2.99 on Amazon.com. You could also become a patron at patreon.com slash Brian E. Denton. If you sign up there, you'll receive a sonnet once a month, plus a link to an ebook of my collected sonnets. Finally, if you like, you can make a one-time donation to my PayPal account. The email there is brianedenton at gmail.com. You can also use that email to contact me. I'd be happy to hear from you. Your support is greatly appreciated. Today's reading and reflection is on Chapter 74. Chapter 74 The little princess lay supported by pillows, with a white cap on her head. The paints had just left her. Strands of her black hair lay round her inflamed and perspiring cheeks. Her charming rosy mouth, with its downy lip, was open, and she was smiling joyfully. Prince Andrew entered and paused facing her at the foot of the sofa on which she was lying. Her glittering eyes, filled with childlike fear and excitement, rested on him without changing their expression. I love you all and have done no harm to anyone. Why must I suffer so? Help me, her look seemed to say. She saw her husband, but did not realize the significance of his appearance before her now. Prince Andrew went round the sofa and kissed her forehead. My darling, he said, a word he had never used to her before. God is merciful. She looked at him inquiringly and with childlike reproach. I expected help from you and I got none, none from you either, said her eyes. She was not surprised at his having come. She did not realize that he had come. His coming had nothing to do with her sufferings or with their relief. The pangs began again, and Mary Bogdanovna advised Prince Andrew to leave the room. The doctor entered. Prince Andrew went out and, meeting Princess Mary, again joined her. They began talking in whispers, but their talk broke off at every moment. They waited and listened. Go, dear, said Princess Mary. Prince Andrew went again to his wife and sat waiting in the room next to hers. A woman came from the bedroom with a frightened face and became confused when she saw Prince Andrew. He covered his face with his hands and remained so for some minutes. Piteous, helpless animal moans came through the door. Prince Andrew got up, went to the door, and tried to open it. Someone was holding it shut. You can't come in, you can't, said a terrified voice from within. He began pacing the room. The screaming ceased, and a few more seconds went by. Then suddenly, a terrible shriek. It could not be hers. She could not scream like that. It came from the bedroom. Prince Andrew ran to the door. The scream ceased, and he heard the wail of an infant. What have they taken the baby in there for? Thought Prince Andrew in the first second. A baby? What baby? Why is there a baby in there? Or is the baby born? Then suddenly, he realized the joyful significance of that wail. Tears choked him. And leaning his elbows on the window, he began to cry, sobbing like a child. The door opened. The doctor, with his shirt sleeves tucked up, without a coat, pale and with a trembling jaw, came out of the room. Prince Andrew turned to him, but the doctor gave him a bewildered look and passed by without a word. A woman rushed out, and seeing Prince Andrew stopped, hesitating on the threshold. He went into his wife's room. She was lying dead, in the same position he had seen her in five minutes before, and despite the fixed eyes and the pallor of the cheeks, the same expression was on her charming, childlike face with its upper lip covered with tiny black hair. I love you all, and have done no harm to anyone, and what have you done to me? said her charming, pathetic, dead face. In a corner of the room, something red and tiny gave a grunt and squealed in Mary Bognabona's trembling hands. Two hours later, Prince Andrew, stepping softly, went into his father's room, The old man already knew everything. He was standing close to the door, and as soon as it opened, his rough old arms closed like a vice around his son's neck, 
and without a word he began to sob like a child. Three days later the little princess was buried, and Prince Andrew went up the steps to where the coffin stood to give her the farewell kiss. And there in the coffin was the same face, though with closed eyes. Ah, what have you done to me? It still seemed to say. And Prince Andrew felt that something gave way in his soul, and that he was guilty of a sin he could neither remedy nor forget. He could not weep. The old man too came up and kissed the waxen little hands that lay quietly crossed on one another on her breast. And to him too her face seemed to say, What have you done to me, and why? And at the sight the old man turned angrily away. Another five days passed, and then the young Prince Nicholas Andreevich was baptized. The wet nurse supported the coverlet with her chin, while the priest with a goose feather anointed the boy's little red and wrinkled soles and palms. His grandfather, who was his godfather, trembling and afraid of dropping him, carried the infant round the battered tin font and handed him over to the godmother, Princess Mary. Prince Andrew sat in another room, faint with fear lest the baby should be drowned in the font, and awaited the termination of the ceremony. He looked up joyfully at the baby when the nurse brought it to him, and nodded approval when she told him that the wax with the baby's hair had not sunk in the font, but had floated. That concludes my reading of chapter 74. I'll now follow it with my reflection on the same. A Year of War and Peace, Day 74 The Lock and the Wax That Floats No sooner does Prince Andrew return home, lifting our spirits, then Princess Liza dies from complications arising from childbirth, deflating our spirits once again. But then, a baby boy is born. So in just two short pages, we do not merely run, but rather sprint the gamut from birth through life and death with the Bokonskis. Poor family. For the last few chapters, at least, it seems as if they're caught in a Dr. Jekyllian world where the doom and burthen of our life is bound forever on man's shoulders, and when the attempt is made to cast it off, it but returns upon us with more unfamiliar and awful pressure. How are they handling it? As it turns out, not so great. While it be easy to place the brain for the Bokonski's emotional instability on this mingled yarn of fate, their experience is really no different from anyone else's. In life, there are tragedies and triumphs, and after laughter comes tears. The Bokonskis are not undergoing anything others haven't gone through before. So far, however, they're failing, Mary accepted, the test that is life. In fact, this chapter stands as a rebuke to the family. This rebuke is located in Princess Liza's expression that accuses the family throughout the chapter. When Prince Andrew first approaches her, she is not happy to see him alive. Instead, her eyes indict him. I expected help from you, they say, and I got none, none from you either. And even after death, she stands as judge, her eyes crying out, I love you all and have done no harm to anyone. What have you done for me? But, dum spiro spero, the seeds of change just may be taking root in Prince Andrew's heart. For the first time in the novel, we see him expressing his love for his wife. My darling, he greets her using a tender expression he has never used with her before. Further, in a sign of good luck, during the baptism of the new Bokonski boy, the hair that the priest cuts from the baby's head and wraps in taper wax floats in the baptismal font. Things could be looking up. It seems as if the lofty sky has taught Prince Andrew something. He does, at least a little bit, seem to change the man. Perhaps enduring the death of his wife will also teach him a lesson. Daily Meditation Therefore, when a difficulty falls upon you, remember that God, like a trainer of wrestlers, has matched you with a rough young man. For what purpose, you may say? Why, that you may become an Olympic conqueror, but it is not accomplished without sweat. Epictetus, The Discourses Alright, so that concludes my reflection on chapter 74 of War and Peace, and my reading as well. I hope you liked it. Thanks so much for listening. Remember that if you'd like to support me, you can do so either by purchasing the ebook, Year of War and Peace, becoming a patron at patreon.com, or making a one-time donation at PayPal. The links to all that are below. Your support is greatly appreciated. Tomorrow we will be reading and reflecting on chapter 75 of War and Peace. Hope you'll join me. Until then, take care of yourselves and others.